Garden Gurus Live is brought to you by Garden Express and Troforte. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Troforte is the leading supplier of controlled release fertilisers and micronutrients and it's committed to delivering environmentally friendly solutions for your garden. Each week we'll be giving away a Troforte prize pack valued at $250. Simply follow, like and comment the weekly code word on Troforte's Facebook page. Well, hello and welcome to The Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran and I apologise because we've started late today and that's because I'm up here in the Kimberley, the West Kimberley, in a place called Broome uh, at the moment working on a, on a uh, tourism program that uh, is going to come to Channel 9 very soon. And um, one of the most iconic things about this part of the world is the flora. It is just remarkable. And you can see right behind me here is a magnificent boab tree. How beautiful is that? It's actually still got some nuts in the tree. Um, the indigenous people here and around town do an amazing job with regards to boab nut artwork. It is absolutely stunning. And um, it's certainly one of the many, many highlights that you'll have in this part of the world. We um, We've been doing all sorts of things today, but uh, one of the things that I did do was get out and actually see uh, some, some pretty remarkable wildlife. And wildlife is totally dependent on us having all of these beautiful things, trees and obviously a, a magnificent environment. And really, that's what the Garden Gurus is all about. It's about helping you create a beautiful environment at home. And of course, the whole idea is that you ask me your questions today and I will do my very best to answer them. I'm sure I'm not going to get them all right, but if I don't, I will do some research if I don't know what it's about and I'll come back to you and let you know. Now, very important couple of things. Uh, you do need to let us know where you are from vitally important. Um, ideally your town and your state. It really does help me with regards to identifying where things are. The other thing that's critically important, here there's a bit of activity going on around the outside of me here too. Uh, the other thing that's uh, critically important with regards to asking questions is to make sure that um, if, it's a, if it's a descriptive, if it's something that really needs to be looked at, that you send us some photographs. It really does make a big difference. 
Now, um, first up, well, I actually wanted to, before we got into too much, I actually wanted to get into our amazing deal. But oh, I should mention, I've got to remember, um, Shaylee is managing the show back in at uh, Guru HQ. Um, and thanks for that, Shaylee, whilst I'm off gallivanting around the countryside. Um, but uh, very important, we mentioned that we're running competitions for you. So uh, the one is the Troforte competition, which is sensational. So that's a $250 gift hamper of Troforte, which is absolutely amazing stuff. And uh, that'll look after the average garden for 12 months. So it's a, it's a pretty impressive package. Now, there'll be a code word that comes up a bit later in today's show, and all you do is take that to the Troforte Facebook page. You like it, and uh, ideally share it with some friends. And at the same time, make sure you pop the code word in. It will really help. And uh, the other one is our friends at Garden Express have given us um, a fabulous $50 Garden Express shopping uh, voucher, which allows you to go shopping online immediately after the show. You can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because Garden Express is your online garden center and they deliver direct to your door. All right, big, uh, big opportunities there for you. Send us all your questions and they are flowing through rapidly. But before we get into them, I think we might just get this Garden Express special offer out the way. It is sensational. So let's see if we can go live to that. Growing fruit at home is incredibly good fun. There's so many varieties these days that are suited to growing in large tubs, which means if you've got a small garden, you can grow them like these. Avocados are absolutely fantastic. There are many varieties that are highly suited to a half wine barrel like this. They can be incredibly productive. This plant is only, well, probably two years old, but next year, it'll produce 10 fruit. The year after, it'll double that the year after, it'll double that. And the whole time, it'll look fantastic. Other trees that are great include dwarf varieties of peach and nectarine, and even blueberries do well in tubs, or in the ground if your soil is slightly acid. But the trees I love growing in pots are what are known as columnar apples. Now, these trees are described as dwarf trees. They get to about two and a half to three metres in height, but they're only 600 mil wide, so it makes this lovely columnar shape. Now, this particular variety is very special. It's called Harmony. It's a beautiful golden apple. It's about mid-size, white creamy flesh, super sweet and lovely and crisp. And a tree like this, well, within a couple of years, it'll be producing somewhere around 20 to 30 fruit. Apple trees require pollinators, and Harmony does best when planted with Herald. It's another column of variety that's just perfect to grow alongside it. If you're wondering how to get your hands on these trees, Garden Express can deliver direct to your door. And they have a special deal for Garden Guru viewers. Dwarf almonds, columnar apples, dwarf nectarines and peaches, even a dwarf plum variety. They're normally $65, but for Garden Guru viewers, just $52. Now, if you love avocados, they've got a great deal on them as well. It's avocado, reed, hass, and fuete, which is absolutely sensational in most Australian garden environments. Now, 68 bucks, that's 20% off the regular retail. That is going to get you started with your very first avocado tree. There's also a super deal on Blueberry Burst. Check it out at gardenexpress.com.au. They're open seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and deliver direct to your door. Growing fruit at home. <laughs> I think we had a little bit of a technical hiccup there, but uh, Shaylee's been doing a great job making sure everything ticks over. Just on avocados, I just picked our first avocados of the season at home on the weekend, and they are softening up as we speak. So I reckon when I get home, on Sunday, I'll be enjoying some magnificent fresh avocados. It's the time of the year to be planting them. And that deal from Garden Express is out of this world. You have four litre bag avocados, normally $85, 20% off $68. Blueberry also, that's a pretty impressive one. That particular blueberry is gorgeous, produces a lot of fruit. 140 mil pots, they're normally $36.90, 20% off $29.50. And of course, um, you've also got all those deciduous trees as well that are part of the deal. Now's the time to be getting your, your fruiting trees and plants and shrubs into the garden. And this is a great deal from our friends at Garden Express. So David and Rowan and 
all the team, Chloe, thank you very much for um, for coming up with something that just makes, I suppose, gardening a little more affordable every week, and, and it's exclusive to you guys. Now, I need to say a big hello, because we're getting lots and lots of... Um, Lots of lovely thank you, yeah, lo lovely uh, hellos. Um, where do I start? Okay, I think I will start with Helen Reed, who's saying hello from Brisbane. Uh, June LaFrance is saying hello from Vincentia, which is in New South Wales. Deidre Dawes is saying hello, but I'm not sure where you're from, Deidre. It's really nice to have you all join us. So thank you so much. Now I am here to answer your questions, and now's the time to start getting them in. And you are doing that. So I'm going to start with Gabby Weaver, who is in, let me have a look here. You are in Collie in WA, uh, Dwarfs, Navels and uh, Mandarins, both going the same way. They're turning a light green towards solid yellowy sort of colour. Now you put dolomite with magnesium around it and the citrus food to, go, to no avail. And the reason is because you put dolomite in. So dolomite is alkaline. When the soils are too alkaline, it locks up iron, magnesium, and also some of those others, manganese, and, and um, it, it's a bit of a problem. So what you're kind of doing is you're um, acidify. Oh, sorry, you're creating an alkaline soil environment when you need to be acidifying the soil. Now you can do that through doing something quite simple, and, and that is simply by um, adding lots and lots of organic compost. Now it's got to be composted down, and I, and I mean that it's been through a proper composting process but it'll make such a big difference. So please, um, more compost into your garden, big difference. Um, you can use acidic fertilizers, so sulfate or potash would be a good one. Sulfate, sulfur gives you an indication that it's, it's acidic in its nature, and that will help. And when that's acidified the soil to a neutral level, all the minerals you've put in, all the magnesium that's locked up in the soil and not available to the roots will suddenly become available. So that's the key. And look, you know, if I was going to do it, I wouldn't do sulfate or potash at the moment. I would do iron sulfate, okay, because you know that the iron's going to do them the world of good. Uh, big hello to uh, Jeff and Rita Mapstone in Delaney's Creek in Queensland. Um, big hello uh, from Lisa, Lisa's Garden in Yarra Valley. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Um, I'll keep rolling along with your questions. Emma Wilcott, you've sent us through a question here in Dublin and South Australia. Um, new to gardening, got some dwarf apples and orange trees. And you had them for a while now. The orange trees at the start of fruiting, but the apples haven't. They look like they're dying and they're not happy. That's a really unusual situation, actually, to be quite honest. And what I would suggest is going on here is that they're probably not getting enough uh, consistency in the moisture in the soil. So mulching does help a lot with apples. Um, if you were seeing some kind of insect attack, you know, leaves torn or, or chewed or, um, you know, a blackness in the stem and it dying down, that could be something quite different. But usually with apples, it's more about consistency of moisture in the soil. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favour and send me a photograph. It will make a big difference in us making a decision as to exactly what's caused that problem. But, um, yeah, uh, you know what? It's one of those things. You do need to be just working continuously with, with fruit trees. Once they're established, two years, three years down the line, they're so easy to care for. But establishment stage is the toughest stage. So hopefully um, that helps you. Uh, now... Now, now, now. Oh, Tyson. Good morning to you, Tyson. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon to you, Tyson. In fact, it's good evening in Victoria. Um, I believe that it is freezing in Vic at the moment. Uh, it's about 32 degrees or something like that here in Broome. Maybe you guys need to come up for a holiday. Um, I feel like I should stay for a holiday and not be here working, but it, it is a lovely part of the world. I believe it has been very cold in Victoria and we're now really starting to see the effects of the cold on gardens. Tyson's brought up that he's got um, a lime tree, he wants to plant one, either in the ground or wine barrels, um, but um, does it have to be somewhere else? Can I give you some tips and advice? Lime trees, lime trees are typically best described as tropical they do love warmer conditions Tyson so if you can have it in a pot where you can sort of position it against a north facing wall um, it'll do really well and should produce lots and lots of fruit for you depending on the type of lime but typically normally most limes that are planted in Australia are Tahitian limes and that'll do really really well 
lots of compost over the top of the soil or straw with a bit of chicken manure over the top in really cold soils. As that chicken manure, as the, the, as the ammonia breaks the, the straw down, it warms the surface of the soil up and that really helps a lot of plants that need that sort of, that sort of tropical sort of environment. So hopefully that helps Tyson. Okay, where do we go next? Lynn in Claremont. Hello, Lynn. Um, I need some advice. Here we go. Actually, June, very cheeky. I'll talk about your little comment in a second. Um, Lynn, it's lovely to have you from Claremont. You're a great supporter of us, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Your gardenias, you've had a bit of a problem with them for a while. You're saying that they're growing okay. They don't have that lovely dark green shiny leaves and not many flowers. Can I help? I certainly can. And my recommendation to you at the moment is that you take a look at applying iron sulfate. At this time of the year, plants that are gross feeders like citrus, uh, particularly things like gardenias, they really benefit from, from um, iron sulfate. So an application of that will really help an awful lot. Um, okay. Let's keep rolling on. There's lots of questions coming through. Uh, Jessica, didn't tell me where you're from, Jessica. I'd love to know how to prune dwarf fruit trees this winter. How much do I take off and where do I do it? Well, it's a little more complex than that. So if they're dwarf nectarines and peaches, they can be pruned back during the winter quite comfortably. If they're dwarf apples, most of these dwarf apples tend to fruit off the first year growth. And if they're fruiting off first year growth, it's going to be problematic when it comes to um, your um, fruiting because basically that first year growth is where the flowers are. If you prune it off, it's no good. The big trend in um, orchards these days, and certainly the recommendation that most of us professional gardeners give, is that you actually prune your fruit trees after they fruited. A lot better to do it then. Usually that's during the growing season. It allows them to sort of expand out and continue on. June LaFrance, I'm going back to you. Very cheeky. Um, you notice the beard's gone. Thank you. Thank you for noticing that. Um, it, yeah, it had been um, kind of driving me crazy. The majority of you, when we voted, actually voted for me to keep it. I'm not so sure I had full support from my mother and my wife, but uh, as it turns out, I decided it's time for a change again. So hopefully I do look a little bit younger because uh, everybody's giving me a hard time about being older. Anyway, uh, try and stop the Troforte on the chin and I'll be fine. It won't grow back, don't worry. Um, okay, so we'll keep moving through. Forget about the beard and moving through. Um, Leah in Brisbane. Uh, Leah, again, you are a great supporter of ours. Thank you very much. Um, you're growing a pineapple in a pot. How often, what type of fertiliser would be um, suitable. So pineapples, um, really interesting. They're bromeliads. So they're a member of the bromeliad family. Bromeliads very typically collect their nutrients from leaf litter falling into um, the, the top of the plant, collecting and breaking down. So it gives you the hint that they don't need a huge amount of fertilizer. However, there is one particular fertilizer you can use with them that, that gets amazing results and it's fish emulsion, believe it or not. So liquid fish emulsion mixed up in a watering can, watered at the right rates over the foliage of the plant, and it encourages really big plump pineapples to grow. Hopefully that helps you. Um, okay, Helen, well, you've got a really difficult one here, and we have to be careful, but uh, the, 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 the question you're asking is one, and I say we have to be careful because I don't want to cause a neighbour fight, but your neighbour's ficus trees seem to be destroying paving bricks. And they're so huge that they obstruct your plants from growing. So really, um, that's a discussion you need to have with your neighbour. And the best way to do it is to invite them around and say, hey, look, is there something we can do together here to stop this your tree, because it's a beautiful tree, I'm sure, invading my garden? Um, and the simple thing is root barriers. So uh, if you're willing to make a once-off um, uh, cut into the soil and cut through those roots, then put a solid root barrier, and that root barrier could be concrete, it could be a solid plastic barrier, but if you put it down, it only needs to go about four or 300 mil deep. It doesn't, that's about that, I, I suppose. Um, it's not a huge depth, but it'll stop all those surface roots coming through and causing that problem with pavers. So maybe your neighbor, um, maybe if you invite them over for a cordial or maybe a glass of wine or something like that and say, hey look, I really love that tree, but it's starting to rip up my paving and I know you're not 
it's not your fault. You're not doing it on purpose. I know it's not doing it on purpose, but I did get some advice about maybe putting in a root barrier. Would you be willing to make a contribution to it or go halves or cover the cost and see what they say? You know, good neighbours, it's an important thing. I think we all need to be friends with everybody. I think we need to live in a kinder world, even if the FICAS is starting to upset the relationship a little bit. Uh, Christy Lee, okay. How to grow pepino melon without anything biting. Now, I'm not really sure what you mean by that, but pepinos are a really interesting plant. Now, they absolutely taste like a melon, but they're actually a member of the Solanum family. That's the same family as tomatoes, for example. And um, interestingly enough, they love growing in bright, sunny positions. Even better, put them in a big tub and let them grow and all the fruit will hang out the tub and it's easy to identify, it's easy to pick. More importantly, they are really susceptible to slugs getting into the fruit when it's laying on the ground and you can't help it laying on the ground because they tend to be a sprawling shrub. So, my suggestion is you grow them in a half wine barrel, let them cascade over the top and then pick the fruit off as they come through. They're delicious and not too many of us are growing them these days. It's a bit of a shame they're very easy to grow from cutting literally break little cuttings off the side of the plant pop them in a glass of water and they'll drop roots straight away it's that easy hopefully Christy leap that really helps you get them back on track okay let's have a bit of a look through here from Raby New South Wales we've got Jody joining us Jody thank you um, your clivias have been destroyed eaten by something in the past two weeks can I shed some light well there's a number of things that love the big fleshy leaves of clivias. Um, surprisingly, not a lot of caterpillars, but things like slaters tend to do it when they run out of food. Slaters traditionally would only eat um, dead organic material. So they're actually a really good uh, natural soil improver if you've got them um, eating that. But when they run out of those organics, they start to go to greens and that can be problematic. It might be slaters. It may be a beetle. It could possibly be a caterpillar but whatever it is it needs to stop now the easiest way to do this and it affects all of them is to apply a um, very low toxic um, plant chemical uh, uh, an insecticide it's called success and uh, success ultra it's from Yates you'll find it in really good garden centers and uh, leading hardware stores everywhere and it's exceptional so I think um, I think that's my solution to you because you don't want the leaves of, of your tr of your um, clivias damaged. It just breaks your heart. All right, let's keep moving along and see what I can do for Margaret Best. Hello, Margaret, uh, from Port Broughton in Upper York Peninsula in South Australia. Actually, um, I think I know you, Margaret. It's a great area. Um, I'd like to try growing an avocado tree in a half wine barrel. Is it possible? And can you recommend a type? And um, what soil do I need to plant it in? Do I need a cross pollinator? Lots and lots of questions, Margaret. There is a thing with avocados where they're relatively self fertile because there are so many being grown in our communities now. Um, avocados are really interesting. They have, um, there's a, a couple of different types. One type will produce male flowers and those male flowers will come out in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they'll produce female flowers. And unless you've got pollinators moving between them which generally doesn't happen you don't get fruit but there are other types that produce female flowers in the morning and male flowers in the evening and if you plant one of those alongside you will get cross-pollination really well so Margaret I would suggest to you that um, what you probably want to do is uh, a couple of couple of dwarf varieties there's some great ones out there at the moment and I've just done a story on the garden gurus it'll come up this weekend I think um, showing you my avocados in my half wine barrels. They're really good and you would have seen them also in that Garden Express clip that I did as well. Um, they they have the dwarf varieties as well. So now is the time to do it. Definitely get two different varieties and they should cross pollinate each other. It's pretty good, I think. Hopefully that helps. Um, oh, you did ask about soil. Avocados can be extremely challenging. So only the very, very best uh, professional potting mix. It's worth the investment. A, a bag of professional potting mix is going to cost you between $15 and $20 and you're probably going to use, I hate to say it, three, maybe even four in a half wine barrel. Might be less, but rough guess. But let me tell you, the hardest thing to do with an avocado is to get them established. 
and that's because they have to develop a root system. Once the root system is established, you can do all sorts of things with them. But the quickest way to get a good, very solid root system, of course, is to encourage very solid growth. And the only way to do that is have very good soil. So um, I would recommend you do that. I recommend you use Troforte for fruit and citrus, and you will find your avocados will produce within five years, probably 20 to 40 avocados within 10 years probably around about the 50 to 100 avocados a year which is more than the average person uh, can actually eat so uh, yeah hopefully that helps Margaret. Uh, Olya you're in Melbourne hello my hydrangeas already struggled over summer five across the front fence full sun can I move them now um, we'll replace them with lilac yeah okay lilac bushes um okay so uh, here's the strange thing about hydrangeas. Hydrangeas, give them time, they will establish and they will be resilient to full sun conditions. Um, the first two or three years is really tough though. They really struggle. So my suggestion to you is that you do what you're going to do and that's make a change. And that those hydrangeas go into a position where they get afternoon shade but morning sun. And if you can find that in your garden, You'll find the plants that you transplant out will really pick up and do really well next year. I wouldn't do it though until winter when most hydrangeas are in full dormancy. So if you can be patient, uh, lilacs will be in full dormancy as well. Um, best time to plant them, best time to transplant the, uh, the hydrangeas. Hopefully that helps you. Wendy, hello. Um, I'm in outer East Melbourne on a very large quarter acre. Um, Oh, sorry, hang on, on a very large, oh no, you've got a very large, sorry. There's a bit of reflection going on here. You can see this, this beautiful boab tree is not shading me anymore. It was when I started this live broadcast, but uh, for some strange reason it's not. But So I'm getting a bit of reflection, which is why um, my, my reading of your question wasn't quite right. Um, you're in outer East Melbourne. You've got a large, very old conifer that started dying after it was sculpted two years ago. Um, when a gum tree fell on it, is there a remedy? There, there, look, there are some treatments for um, some of the diseases that get into conifers uh, as they get old. Uh, they tend to get some fungal diseases and um, there's a couple of treatments that you can get from garden centres. It's very specialised, so you really want to go to a good garden centre. I would be thinking somebody like Garden World. Uh, they are well worthwhile taking a drive out to and checking out. They do a great job. Talk to them about uh, what you can use because there's an issue here and that is that with a large tree, you can't spray over the top of that tree. It's not realistic, but you can inject. And again, a, 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 an independent garden centre with, with qualified horticulturists will be able to give you that really technical advice on how you should best do it or if it's not worthwhile. And um, certainly providing a photograph will help as well. But I suspect what's happened is when um, the tree was pruned, that it's gone from one um, conifer to another and the one that it uh, has has they've, they've pruned previously has had this fungus sitting in there it's probably been dormant but um, with the tree being active um, and growing and suddenly getting this disease it's starting to 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 go backwards which would be a bit of a shame but it's often happens with older trees anyway I kind of rambled a bit there but hopefully that makes sense Jessica I'm in Adelaide Hills, okay, we've got a dwarf nectarine and a plum, and then there's a standard apple tree. What would be in, sorry, all would be in first first year of growth, I feel. Yeah. I don't have the rest of that, Jessica, um, so I'm not quite sure what I can answer for you there. That's, um, that's yeah, I'm sure I'm missing something. Um, that doesn't quite make sense. But anyway, we'll, we'll sort it out. That's okay. In the meantime, uh, Tyson Sanders has come through with a second question. Uh, you're on fire, Tyson. Well done. Is a citrus fruit, it's a citrus fruit question. Can I please plant a pineapple? Oh, it's not a citrus fruit. It's plant a pineapple in the ground or in wine barrels or in pots or somewhere else. Can you please give me some tips and advice? I don't know whether you managed to make it to the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show, Tyson, but there was a very, very good, um, I, I was like blown away by these glass houses from the guys at Sproutwell Greenhouses. And and um, Clayton, the, 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 the boss there, he was looking at the right pots for 
using in a controlled environment like a glass house. And he wasn't happy with self-watering pots that were available. So he basically said, um, look, I'm going to develop my own pots. And he did. He designed these amazing self-watering pots that can be linked to each other so water can pass through. Anyway, it's, it's been a massive success. And he was growing pineapples in these pots. And the pineapple looked sensational. And the, that's why I'm telling you, if you can, if it's possible, get a glass house. Put it into a pot there. In Melbourne, the conditions are pretty cold. They're not dissimilar actually in some ways to where I live in an elevated position in, in Perth. Uh, it gets very cool during the winter months and particularly at night and pineapples don't like it so they need to be able to grow in a pot kept in a warm protected place. I a northern position so northern sunlight during the winter and they will still do okay. Hopefully that helps Tyson. Um, it's a bit of a convoluted story I know. Um, okay now let me just go back um, Okay, 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 here we go. Um, I've got a cool season grass lawn. It's, you're in Canberra, okay? They present some interesting challenges. Um, you've been battling creeping oxalis. They've had good results spraying bow and arrow, but I suspect there's a seed load in there waiting to launch and attack this spring. Is there a pre-emergent spray? There are pre-emergents available. Now, just for those people who don't realise what they are, pre-emergents are herbicides that you can either spread a granule, um, so there's a couple that are granulated, or you can spray over the surface of the soil. And what it does is, as, as the seed germinates, it kills the seed off straight away. And uh, it kills all seeds that are germinating straight away. So don't you know, think that uh, it'll only kill the weeds, it will kill everything. But it, when you've got really severe problems, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good solution. And certainly, you know, professional nurseries and, uh, and growers would use this to help control competition with, with the plants that they're growing. Um, I did want to say to you also that there is a, an issue, and it's, um, it's one that you probably need to be aware of, but um, when you let uh, weeds seed and drop their seeds into the garden, those seeds don't germinate necessarily straight away in the first year. In fact, there's that old saying of seven years... Uh, of uh, one year's weed seeds is seven years weeds and that's because they can sit dormant in the soil for a long time before germinating and um, that's why we do need to weed gardens and we do need to mulch because mulching is another way to, to keep those weeds down um, so hopefully that's uh, there's a couple of options there for you but uh, there are pre-emergence it's really I would recommend again you talk to your local garden centre about what they recommend for your local area in Canberra okay let's keep rolling along um, who have we got next we've got Tahani in Perth hello um, got a pot with bulbs in it from last season they started growing but I've noticed the soil has a distinct odour like mushrooms plus a few months ago it had a pretty fungus growing out of the base of the self-water pot. Well, the mycelium from that fungus will be all spreading. All the roots will be through that pot. And um, it's probably going to spring back into life as we move into sort of more moist conditions in Perth. And so I would suggest that uh, your bulbs will be competing against some fungi. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. These things happen and in nature it happens quite commonly in the soil where bacteria and fungi actually compete against each other all the time. Some fungi you know, um, they will eat other fungi. There's all sorts of things going on that we just have no idea about. What I would recommend you do though, because it's bulbs, because it's early season, because you want them to do well, I would take them, I would take the soil and I would wash the soil off and I would replant those bulbs uh, into some fresh potting mix and they'll do really well and you'll get a great result. So give that uh, let's keep rolling along. Um, these questions. Oh, you're asking if you should throw the soil out. I do think you should throw the soil out. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Sandra, I think I'm going to start with Sandra. What's the easiest way to dig holes for new plants in a soil that's plenty of palm and other roots in the way? Well, very problematic for a start because you know if you're digging holes and there's already lots of roots in there, that the plant you're putting in, which is not established, is going to be competing against all those roots. So it's highly unlikely they will do well and 
uh, well, sorry, not do well, and then that they will die. So you'll be disappointed. Um, you might want to think about maybe more a ground cover that's just going to spread over the top of the soil and cover the soil, cover the roots. Um, but certainly anything that's going to be in competition to something like palm roots, it's not going to make it. So digging, you know, whilst you may, I can probably give you five ways that you can dig holes easier. The truth of the matter is that um, you're probably not going to get the result you want unless you take that palm out. And that'll make a big difference. Okay, um, Debbie. Okay, this is a good one. This is a, a bit of a problem. It's um, it's a problem in WA at the moment. Debbie's asked, um, how can you tell if you have um, polyphagous polyphagous shot hole bore? Now, this is a a a beautiful. Um, uh, sorry, beautiful. It's a it's a plant. It's an insect that affects beautiful plants and some significant, very beautiful trees um, in a very negative way. It, it really sets them back badly. In fact, it kills them off. Um, you've got some big native trees and they're dying, but you've only found a couple of holes. This is, I think, this is quite a distinctive West Australian problem. You haven't told me, Debbie, but I'm assuming you are from Perth. Um, there's a bit of a war going on and the agriculture department's trying to help um, slow this movement down. I don't think we're going to stop it. It's another insect that's been introduced that's going to change our landscape, this one. It will kill a lot of the very big trees that we love and, and admire. One of them being um, the, um, the coral flame tree. Flame trees do not like this insect at all and it bores into their trunks and it ring barks them and they die. You think you're seeing some holes. Um, what I would recommend you do is you jump on um, the Agriculture Department of WA's website. They have an opportunity for you to take photographs, take some close-up shots, send it in. They'll help identify it. And if they think it is this, they'll probably send a couple of officers out because they're currently recording the movement of this going through. And um, you can also obviously grab the um, the the app. And I think that um, I might ask Shaylee to pop that app detail up because to be quite honest they help people all over the country with this app it's a really cool idea um, technology it's really helping us all an awful lot okay where do we go next uh, Nikki Roberts hello Nikki I've got some pig face and daisy growing close to a banana tree they're all doing well so far but long term is this going to be okay you're in Perth that's another Perth which is great um, Nikki great question my experience is that uh, the roots of the banana tree are actually quite intensive as you get closer to the tree, as to the plant. Bananas are the, the largest herb uh, of all herbaceous plants and um, most of the activity for a banana is actually in the soil. The growing shoot comes out of the soil. The trunk that we see is just uh, herbaceous growth. It's just a just a, a, a source basically for the, for the foliage to grow. It's crazy. They're, they're incredibly beautiful. Um, what I would suggest is that they will get to a certain point and the banana will protect itself as they do in nature by having this intensive root system that other plants can't compete against. And I've certainly never seen daisies or pig face uh, end up choking a banana out. So I think you're okay. We should be fine, I think. Um, okay, so where do we go next? Who's got another question for me? Okay, I'm going to have... Let me have a look. Oh, Fiona. This is a good one. Uh, my lime tree. It's always in flower or fruit. Great problem to have. When can I prune it? It's now okay, even though it has new growth and has flowers. Certainly if you prune it, uh, Fiona, you are going to find that um, your fruit crop next time is um, not what it, what it used to be. Your fruit crop will be something that's um, quite different. So what I would suggest you do is that um, you give it a very light prune um, and if you're if you're continuously getting fruit then you avoid that that particular um, challenge and and what I mean by that is you just start pruning selectively over the year instead of a hard prune which is sometimes can set a tree back two or three years so um, unusual that it's continuously flowering and fruiting but as you say what a great problem um, Pauline is in Moray Field in Brisbane. Hello, thank you so much for, for joining us again, Pauline. Now, you've planted self-pollinating for joas about 15 years ago. No fruit. So you planted a different type three years later.
rooted for the first time this year. Okay, okay, okay. Um, interestingly, you've said, how do I get it bigger and more fruit next year? Um, this is your first time on the show. Pauline, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's a really good question. Fajoas are the most unusual fruit, I think. They are really part of the South Pacific. You'll find them quite commonly. I just recently spent a bit of time on Norfolk Island. The Fajoas were in season there. And uh, initially, some people go, oh, it's too much for me. But in actual fact, um, they're an acquired taste. Once you start to love Fajoas, you, they're quite addictive. Um, the problem with the one that's been in the ground for 15 years is a very unusual situation. And it suggests that it's sitting on a lot of water and a lot of nutrient, because that's the only reason why it wouldn't produce flour. Um, the one that's producing fruit, how do you get it bigger and more fruit next year? You feed it. It's simple, it's food and water, and it will grow. But you've got to make sure you turn the water off and the food off before it comes into its next round of flowering, which you know is going to be, you probably want to stop feeding around about February. Um, and the reason you want to do that is because then the tree will re-establish what the conditions are and uh, that'll help it set more fruit. In the meantime, the one that you've got, I'm quite fascinated by that, and there's a simple little thing you can do, um, a couple of little techniques, but just copper nails, just duck down to your local hardware store, um, bang a couple of copper nails into the base. It's, it, I would imagine it's quite large to be quite honest, so you might want four or five. This often triggers a sense that it's being attacked, that it could die, and that it will then burst into flower and produce fruit. So that might be worthwhile doing with that large mature tree. You might end up with a truckload of fruit. It's worthwhile doing. Uh, okay. Now, I've got last week and one... Last week and one... Trof oh, so I think this is you. Sorry, I realise now it's, it's a two-part... A message for me. It says that you tuned in for the first time last week and won Tro Four Day Pack. Well done. That's great. Well, hopefully it helps uh, keep those plants of yours producing lots and lots of fruit in the future. Certainly that Tro Forte um, fruit and citrus, amazing fertilizer for stimulating fruit growth. Okay. Alia, um, Olia, you are in Melbourne. My daffodils have been in the ground for four years. No flowers, just lush green growth. It's suggesting that there's been not enough cold conditions to trigger that, that flower set. We used to believe that putting bulbs into the crisper when you get them in from the grower would be would trigger all the, the flower shoots to, to, to take off. But um, recently, thanks to my friend David Van Berkel, I learned that it's actually not true. It is a fallacy. It is one of those myths that's been spread through people like me, and I do apologise. The truth of the matter is that the flower is actually set in November. So in actual fact, around about October and November, if you want to get some daffodils producing flowers, you need to find lots and lots of old ice. And you throw the ice over the ground where the daffodils are, and it will chill that ground down. And that will basically set the flowering for the following year. We're totally manipulating mother nature here, but that's, that's the trigger, that's how we do it. So hopefully hopefully that helps uh sue robinson uh you are in Gun gunelaba sorry sorry about that i don't think i've heard of gunelaba before in new south wales thanks very much sue um what kills nut grass thanks in advance now there are some selective herbicides that kill nut grass when it's really bad you need to use those problem with nut grass is if you pull it out it's got all these little nodules around uh, these little bulblets at the base and when you pull it out you end up with 50 new plants so you don't want to be doing that that would be a big mistake we have got 15 minutes to go on the show and um, you know what we're we're starting to actually kick a few few goals here we've just plowed through quite a lot of questions there's still quite a lot coming through if you want your questions answered get them through now I will do my best now just uh, so you know uh, that app for identifying bugs um, it's from the government. It's called My Pest Guide Reporter. Um, it, so just I'll repeat it again, My Pest Guide Reporter. And My my Pest Guide Reporter allows you to take photographs and send the photographs in for identification. It also provides you um, some matching of, um, of uh, symptoms uh, and then identifies the pest as well. It's a very clever app. So well worthwhile looking at downloading. I hope you will give it a go. Um, Maris McBain, uh, you're in Adelaide, South Australia. 
Photos are included. Thank you, Maris. We're renovating our front yard, removing diasmas and conifers. I'm not sure what to plant in their place. What would you suggest? All right, well, without seeing the photographs, um, I would suggest, yeah, I can see that. Okay, well, look, you know what? I would suggest you go for some of these beautiful new grevilleas. There's been some amazing breeding done um, and some great new varieties, really compact forms that produce masses of flower. Um, they, they're very similar size and shape when mature to the plants that you've got in there but they're fully colourful, they, pro they provide so much nectar for birds and bees, and they look sensational. The flowers are very large, so my suggestion is you look for some of those, and the place to get them, of course, is in your leading local garden centre, and you want to ask for some of that breeding that's come out of Kings Park and Botanic Gardens in Western Australia. Uh, the work Digby's done there is just blows my mind. I'm growing some of those crocodiles in my own garden, and they are just beautiful, absolutely stunning. Some amazing new flowers. All right, let's keep uh, let's keep rolling along. Uh, that was Maris, uh, Vanessa Morton um, in Kumbaba. Oh, I hope I got that right, Vanessa. You're on the Gold Coast. Um, how would I go about growing uh, finger limes? Okay, well, actually, finger limes are a really good question. Uh, takes a while for finger limes to establish. Probably in most places best grown in pots. They can grow in the gardens, but they do grow really well in pots, but only use the very best potting mix. Uh, feed them regularly for the first two years, vitally important. Um, if you feed them, um, you'll find you'll get great results. They really do grow quite well. And once they're established, year three, year four, year five, you start getting lots and lots of finger lines. Uh, Ian Brunton, thank you very much. That is fantastic. You've given us the link to the, to that site, folks. Make sure you check that out. And it's great to have you join us, Ian. It's been a while since we caught up. Hope you're well. Um, okay, let's keep rolling along. We'll go to Tanya. I'm not sure where you're from. Oh, you're in Tasmania, Tanya. Thank you. And it's lovely to have you join us. Do you fertilise lemon trees all year round? I'm in Tassie. Uh, thank you for your show. It's great. Now, look, good question. The first thing is lemons are not all lemons. So some lemons do eureka tends to flush fruit quite regularly throughout the year. Um, but Lisbon and some of those more, I, I suppose, um, the juicing types tend to have one or two crops maximum. And the trick with feeding is to feed after you've harvested the crop. So basically once the trees start to turn yellow, go through, you'll, you'll do really, really well. Um, and it just looks after the tree. They, they're so productive. They need the energy they take out of the soil to be replaced. So that's why you use really good quality fertilizers. And if you can get one like this Treforte, one that we've been talking about, that also has the microbes in it, uh, particularly citrus and fruit version, uh, it just does the world a good to the health of your soil. So well worthwhile uh, looking out for it. You'll find it in independent garden centers. All right, so this is a good question. Uh, this is a good mate of ours, Glenn, who tunes in every week and supports us. And Glenn, um, I never stop to really say this, but for all of you regulars um, who tune in week in, week out, and, and I've gone and shuffled the time today and you've tuned in again, um, you know, I really appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Uh, sincerely, it's it's really wonderful. And it's great to be able to help you with your garden questions. The question you've got is about dragon fruit. You're growing on the Gold Coast flowers but no fruit now do i have any suggestions to get it to fruit does it need a companion plant to pollinate you tried hand pollinating a lot of people do um, but if i can be completely honest the key to the whole thing is generally a moth that's active at night and um, it's not always around and there is a cheat that you can apply to this and that is to get yourself some honey and take it and paint it in a few little spots on the plant, up the up the stem of the dragon fruit, up the, 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 the growth, up the, the, the trunk. And what will happen is ants have a remarkable sense of sweetness. They love it. And they will gravitate to your dragon fruit from miles away. And they will walk up and they'll get some of that sweetness and they'll move up because they think it's coming from the flower. They'll go into the flower and they'll move all around it and they get the pollen all over them. Then they'll move to the next flower and the next flower and the next flower and all of your fruit will be pollinated by those ants. It's a bit of a cheat. Um, generally using honey, uh, you know, in this sort of situation is not always the most recommended thing. Certainly some people would be very concerned about it. But in this instance, to get things started, it should help. So I, 
I really hope that little cheat helps you. Okay, let's just keep rolling along. And again, thanks very much, Glenn Miller, for your support. It's very much appreciated. Okay, what has Shaley got for me? Oh, plant of the week. Well, I, I did want to talk about this. Um, so this magnificent tree is one of those iconic uh, trees of the Northwest, I suppose, um, the Boab tree. Interestingly enough, the Boab tree is related um, to the Baobab out of Africa, out of Madagascar and um, the Mascarene Islands, where you'll see them growing, uh, also in Mozambique, where you'll see them growing um, in massive stands. They're different, they're different species, but they're all related. And what makes them so remarkable is their ability to live in a very wet environment for six, six months of the year, and then in an incredibly dry environment for six months of the year. So they evolve to store moisture in their body, in their trunk and they hold that and then they use that in the second half of the year um, but they are such a i don't know they're a spiritual part of the landscape they're gorgeous and they're not going to grow in places like melbourne and adelaide uh, i certainly i saw uh, the margaret river tree company i think they are called uh, at the melbourne international flower and garden show they had one or two there and some some grass trees certainly it's a lot harder to grow these trees in cooler climates even in Perth, their growing seasons cut from six months to seven, seven, eight months to uh, maximum four months a year. So they really do struggle, but they, it is possible in a climate like Perth to grow them. I think it's possible to grow them in Sydney, and I, I'm definitely sure it's possible to grow them in, uh, in Brisbane and further north. So worthwhile giving it a go if you can. Um, they certainly, they're, they're rare to get your hands on, but they're certainly well worthwhile growing. And a great food source for Aboriginal people, the Indigenous people of, of this area here, use these, the seeds, the nuts and the shoots, the, the new growth shoots, even the roots um, are a source of moisture when things really are quite difficult. So um, yeah, I hope that um, you know, I hope that, uh, that that it's an interesting plant that you might consider having a go yourself at home. Now, I am conscious we've got six minutes to go, so I'm going to keep rolling along and we'll try and get through all these questions. There's lots of really, really interesting things going on at the moment uh, in your gardens, and I would love to talk about all of them. I'm not going to get to them all today, but I'll, I'll fly through what I can from here on. Vita Fu, you're in Melbourne. Um, thanks for joining me, Vita. Um, you want to know the best fertilizer for citrus plants. I'm growing lemons, cafelines, and, and calamondons uh, from that spelling. Uh, and Vita, look, you know, citrus have a very unique diet. They require high levels of iron and um, magnesium and certainly uh, of potash. So you need to think about uh, the type of fertilizer you get. It's a good question you ask. Certainly going for specialist fertilizers is vitally important. Uh, one exercise you should always do, Vita, and it's worthwhile taking a little tub of um, some soil from your garden, just the, the top sort of, I don't know, five centimetres or so. Take it and um, show it to your garden centre. Ask if they'll do a pH test for you. If your pH is pretty much neutral, then general uh, citrus specialised fertilisers will do an amazing job for you and you'll get great results. Um, if your pH is out a little bit, they'll give you some advice on how to balance the pH and get the best results. Hopefully, uh, that's that's going to work for you. I'm getting some great comments too. Leah Robinson, thank you for, uh, for your feedback on the later time slot. It's nice to sit down after a week at work and listen in. Thank you. I hope you're having a, a glass of wine and um, relaxing and enjoying uh, what is the beginning of a great weekend, I'm sure, for you. Robin Shaw is a great friend. Um, Robin. Appreciate the shuffle time for this week too. I'm normally flogging myself at the gym uh, when this is a, when we're live in the morning. So okay, that's great, great feedback. Thanks, folks. We're always trying to find the right um, the right time to suit you all, and hopefully this does. Um, let me have a look. I'm working my way through all these questions. Christine Rankin, uh, interesting uh, point about the dragon fruit. Christine says had a flower and now there's a fruit and we don't really have any ants as they've been controlled when we have our pest control done. How does it, how long does it take to ripen? More than likely it's the moth done its job for you, Christine. I think mine has been fertilized more by moths this year than ants, but I encourage both and every single flower on my dragon fruit is producing a fruit and they're remarkably quick. So within probably four weeks, you are going to have a mature fruit, but you'll know straight away because 
the fruit will actually colour up and more than likely in your garden it will split. And the reason it'll split is because it's getting more moisture than when the, the plant originally set the size of the fruit. This is quite a common problem. I'm hearing it from people with citrus, where citrus start to split. And it's because when the fruit was set, conditions were dry and, and nutrients were at a, a minimum. But as we get into more moisture, as we get into winter, we're getting more rainfall, the, the plant's natural instinct is to just keep taking that moisture up. It needs moisture. So it'll take it up and it'll put it all in that fruit. And then that fruit will grow, outgrow the, the actual set size it was meant to be and split open. And uh, that happens a lot with dragon fruit in our environment. So a little tip. Um, Daphne, uh, amazing as usual. Thank you. Trevor is so knowledgeable, explains everything so well. Uh, no jargon. Thank you. I work really hard on cutting out the, the jargon and the, the botanical names just so that we can make things accessible for you because gardening is a natural thing, a natural thing for us to, to participate in and, and to, to be doing on a regular basis. And I think it's a really really important thing that we all garden for our own mental health and our physical health so making it accessible making it a practical um, is is what i try and do so thanks for your feedback i really do appreciate that daphne you're very kind jane you are in jane majors in nolamara in wa please could you tell me when i should fertilize our spring flowering bulbs love the show never miss watching thank you so much jane spring flowering bulbs are a really interesting one um, Interestingly enough, uh, spring flowering bulbs have all the energy stored in the bulb. They, they basically, as soon as they've finished flowering, they'll either put energy into the seed. If you take that flower out, they'll, they'll take the energy from the leaves and store it all in the bulb and make it a bigger bulb. So there's a couple of little tricks, you know, when you've finished flowering, cut the stem off and all the goodness, leave the leaves and all the goodness that's, that's gained from the sun, from, from, from the light, from the photosynthesis that the plant goes through will go back into the bulb and that should really help. So I hope I've helped you a little bit. Um, it's certainly one way to, to get the best results. What it really means though is that you do feed after the bulb has flowered. So just as you've got the flower starting to appear, um, give it a feed. You don't want to rush the flower through because that will it'll speed up its growth. But as you see the flower, typically a spring flowering bulb, you would give it a feed then and all the goodness will get stored in that bulb. So that's the time to do it. Uh, Glenn, hi Trevor, I hope you realise the terrific service um, that you provide to the gardening community across Australia. We really appreciate you and your dependable advice. Thank you very much, Glenn, that's super kind of you. I should always say that uh, I've got a, an amazing team of people that work around the outside of me. We couldn't do it without the likes of Shay Lee, who's pushing buttons and making all of this work. I'm just here sharing my advice um, in sunny broom while it's a bit cool, I believe, in Perth at the moment. So, uh, yeah, no, thanks so much. And everybody's telling us they like the later time slot. Maybe, Shaylee, we need to um, we need to rethink our start times. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Okay, uh, Dorothy, I want to buy cotton seed meal to put on my camellia bed. I have never heard of that. I'm assuming it's a byproduct of, uh, of cotton production, but I've never, ever seen it... Um, available in garden centers and i'm assuming it's a kind of mulch so that's really interesting um let me do some research uh well shaley and i'll do a little bit of research if we can find where that is and also dorothy if you could let us know where you are that would help us as well um, big help margaret big hello from you thank you why are my leaves yellow on my lemon trees but there's plenty of lemons well uh I, Really, at the moment, Margaret, the big thing is that conditions are cooling down. Availability of key greening agents, nitrogen, iron, magnesium, is slowing down. And at the same time, if your soil pH is a little bit on the alkaline side, those nutrients are probably being locked up in the soil. It's not an issue right now because you've got lemons and they look great. But after you've harvested the lemons, if you don't supplement the, those greening agents, those greening minerals that need to be in the soil, you're going to have a problem. So let's uh, make sure that you get a good citrus fertilizer um, in. And uh, and <laughs> and it's interesting. We've got a few people saying, "No, I prefer <laughs> I prefer the earlier slot." Thanks very much. That's um that's great from all of you. I am looking, and we have just got so many comments coming through. And thank you so much for for 
you know, for participating. It's a, it's a big deal for us. We love being able to help and we, we really uh, put a lot of effort into making this work. We've gone just over the hour, so um, I probably need to, to wind it all up. Uh, let's go to awarding our, um, our $50 gift voucher from Garden Express. I'm just having a look through the two questions. They're really good. I think Debbie... Uh, Debbie May, the shot hole borer um, question is actually a really, really good one. And the, the spin of that for everybody here has been the ability to grab that app. Um, you'll see it's it's up on the on the, the link there. Ian Brunton sh shared it with us. Um, thank you very much, Ian. Um, that is a great app. Download it. Have it on your phone. You can walk around in your garden. You can take photographs and it'll help you identify what problems are. It's a really cool thing. I don't want you to stop tuning into us. I always want to be able to help you with your questions, but this is a good one when you need a bit of help at the last minute. So I hope that helps. Um, what else do we need to talk about, uh, Shaylee? Uh, the Garden Express website, don't forget about that. This option, I, I've got to tell you the citrus uh, particularly and also the avocados in this offer that they put up will not last. It's going to be on the show tomorrow on the Garden Gurus. And uh, I know the, the stocks are quite limited. So please, um, if you want one, uh, take advantage of this special discount. Go and take advantage of it. They are absolutely fantastic. Um, Garden Express, you know, couldn't be more grateful. They're just such a wonderful group of people. It's, a, it's a, a, a fantastic family business. They've brought gardening to the armchair. You can shop seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they'll deliver it to your doorstep. How good was that during COVID? Um, great company. So big thanks to them. Big thanks to our friends at Troforte. Um, also, uh, should mention with Troforte, there is a code word. And the code word is compost. That's it. So um, make sure you go to the Troforte Facebook page. Like it. Very important you like it. And then pop that in and you will be in the running for a $250 um, Trophy four day pack and it is absolutely sensational so um, really cool and I know Garden Express have also put up a little post here saying they've got a spring bulb mystery box only $15 so jump online and take advantage of that never miss an opportunity Rowan well done I love it okay now I think we have just about run out of things to do what I want to do is point out that we have the Garden Gurus on Channel 9 tomorrow we are moving through the series now uh, it is, it's been a great series, but it's just getting better and better and better. And there are some great stories I think you will absolutely love. Make sure you check it out and do me a favor. Tell us what you think. And if we're missing some of the stories that you want to, to see and hear, then, um, then send us a note. We're, we're listening to you. We are part of your community. You are part of, of us. And we really want to hear what it is you want to know. And so we can put all the effort we put into things uh, towards the things that you want. Now... I am in Broome. It is uh, now officially four o'clock Broome time, and I don't know if you know anything about Broome time, but uh, that is that is the time for you to uh, to head off and have a nice cold drink. Um, for those of you that uh, do not want to watch us tomorrow, I should mention apparently we're on at the same time as the King's coronation. Can you believe it? Uh, I don't know what to say to him at the moment, but he's being very inconsiderate to have done that. Nevertheless. Um, if you can't watch us because you do want to watch uh, uh, the King's Coronation, then my little suggestion is make sure you tune in a bit later on simply by jumping on ninenow.com.au. You can watch the program whenever you want. There's actually a large number of you that do that these days, and uh, I understand it. It's so convenient. I'm Trevor Cochran. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week for another great episode of The Garden Gurus Live, and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow on Channel 9. See you then.